outside our window. And the birds are chirping all around in this happy little rural southern town. Hello and welcome to Rusty Water Towers, the podcast in search of faith and hope in rural life and ministry. I'm your host, Jonathan Lamaster Smith, or as folks often call me, Dr. J. Each episode of the podcast, I'll talk with a guest about their experience in rural life and ministry as we search the stories, examples, and images of creative faith and hope that I believe are latent in our rural communities. My guest today is the Reverend Karen Monk. She is a pastor and district superintendent in the New York Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. I've collaborated with her recently to present a webinar in the Catskill Hudson District where she serves. We'll get to know Karen in just a bit. But first, each week we like to talk about a country music song and how it impacts rural life. And today we're listening to the Tanya Tucker classic, Delta Dawn, and trying to figure out what that flower is that she has on. So while Tanya Tucker is the singer that comes to mind when I think of this song, it's been covered by several people, including Waylon Jennings, Bette Midler, and Helen Reddy. This song is actually features as an epigraph in for a chapter in my dissertation because it speaks to the hauntedness that is often present in rural spaces. Delta Dawn was left by a man who promised her love and life and a mansion in the sky, and now she wanders, waiting for him to come. She was hoping for a future he promised her, and now she's dealing with the ghost of that future that won't leave her alone. She's 41 and her daddy still calls her baby, and all the folks around Brownville say she's crazy. Because she walks downtown with a suitcase in her hand, looking for that mysterious dark head man. Delta Dawn is so many rural folk. They had the futures they were promised snatched from their hands as the factories closed, as the farms got bought out, the logging stops, or the local school closed. They wander, maybe at least mentally and spiritually, through life with a suitcase in their hand, waiting for the future to come back and take them where they were promised, even if it's not a place, but a reality. The thing is, from wandering to numbing, there is a fear that people will turn to ways to numb the loss of promise instead of, instead of dealing with the reality of what is going on. Whether it's alcohol, drugs, media, or something else, people will escape and lose interest in the realities of the present time. But since this is a podcast about hope, I'm not going to leave it there. The thing is, for me, Delta still has hope. She hasn't given up. She's still carrying her suitcase around. And the thing is, the town tolerates her, so they still have a fondness for her, a connection to her. They haven't kicked her out. They haven't committed her. They let her wander because they know the things that life can do to you. Uh, and maybe they still have hope that he might return or that maybe she'll come to and a new opportunity will arise that will help her grow. So like always, I'll add this to our Rusty Water Towers playlist on Spotify. So now let's take a chance to get to know our guest. Karen, what we usually like to do is ask people about the song first. So what's your experience with Delta Dawn? Um, sure. So my first response to when you, you told me about that we'd be talking about Delta Dawn is I remember the Helen Reddy version. Ah. And I immediately go to, I am riding in the backseat of my parents' 1973 Buick LeSabre with a 455 engine. Yes. We are driving across the Mississippi Delta between Mississippi and Texas, between where we were living at that time and my dad's hometown. And as even as like a third third grader, number one, 41 was ancient. Mm. So we'd drive through towns and I'd be looking on the sidewalk mm -hmm. for this, for Delta Dawn, for oh, this nice. uh, woman standing there with the suitcase and her flower. So, and even as a third grader, I found that pretty poignant, but I, um, but I also was looking for her. Mm. And what you said made me think about, you know, it's true in a lot of our small towns, there's, there are people who've been through a lot, but there's always a place mm -hmm. for them. Um, and a place of care and a space to be held. Mm. So that, you know, you made me think about that again, but that's my association. It, it reminded me of like the Ode to Billy Joel. Oh, yes. You know, the first songs I remember hearing off my, my parents' radio or on mm -hmm. the uh, LPs. We had Bobby Gentry's album, you know, yes. so that just took me back immediately mm. uh, to the backseat of that 1973 Buick LeSabre driving across the Delta. I just love how songs will trigger memories that you're, oh you think gosh. about. And you'll just hear a song. And you're like, I haven't heard that song in 25 years, but it's there. And it's it's triggering something for me that hopefully is a happy memory. Uh, it never, it's not always, but for people, but music's powerful yeah, like power. that. It's yeah. powerful. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, and uh, 
you have some media recommendations for us later, but right now I want to take a chance to get to know know you. Tell tell us a little bit about your life, a little bit about growing up rural, if you grew up rural, or your mm -hmm. time in rural ministry. Sure. So I spent the first 10 years of my life uh, moving across the South. So my mm. dad was a drilling engineer. My mom was a teacher. She was from Mississippi. He was from Texas. They met at a boarding house in northern Mississippi um, mm. when she was teaching and he was roving around in the oil fields. And my brother and I were born like four years into their marriage. And then we moved 10 times before wow. I was, I mean, sorry, five times before I was 10. So itinerancy, I was prepared for it early. <laughs> But when I was 10, we finally landed in my dad's hometown. So I had the opportunity to grow up from that point forward um, in deep east Texas, uh, Gilmer, the home of the East Texas Yamboree. Uh, you know, Friday night football, lights town, mm. uh, a band, playing in the band, marching band, and uh, living near my grandparents. And my great grandparents were still living when we mm. moved there. And I had great aunts and uncles, so there was always Sunday dinner was always a big thing. Um, whether we were at my grandmother's house or we went up to my great-grandparents' house, um, everybody gathered on Sunday dinner. And Sundays were, it was the meal, it was talking about the preacher, <laughs> and then they were sitting around visiting, yeah. visiting for the afternoon. My nephew is actually the fifth generation to be on that, to work that land Wow. Where my dad was actually born. So, you know, when I reflect on my own rural roots, it's like, oh, wow, they really do go deep. I really am that country. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I forget that. I really am that country. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, you know, it was a wonderful multi generational. Um, we played in the woods. You know, it was, uh, it was a great way to grow up mm -hmm. um, and to be grounded in the world. It's also been good to move out into a larger world. But Mm -hmm. In East Texas, it was my missionary Baptist grandma yeah. and a young, a young United Methodist pastor who helped me to hear my call into ministry. There were no clergy women around me. Um, I went to Bible camp, so, you know, I read women should not teach or have authority in the church. I felt this nudging from God that I, you know, I loved the church. Um, I loved being part of my youth group. Loved every facet. Sunday was, you know, Sunday morning worship, Sunday school, youth group, youth choir. Uh, and then Sunday evening worship, loved all of it, but didn't didn't think there was, you know, women weren't preachers. So um, I'm talking to my grandma one afternoon and she said, what do you, what do you think? You, I'm a teenager. She says, what do you think you want to be when you grow up? And I thought, well, I'll just I'll mess with my missionary Baptist grandma. And I said, well, grandma, I might want to be a preacher, pastor. And she said she paused. She said, well, if the Lord calls you, the Lord will equip you. And hmm. I was like, what? <laughs> she was supposed to be my out. You know what I mean? Grandma's yeah. supposed to say, well, no, honey, that can't be right. You know, she was my spiritual guide. What? <laughs> what? So uh, paradoxically, she really helped me hear my call. And a, and a young United Methodist pastor um, who helped guide me and say, yeah, you know what? There's a place for you. Let's look at college and let's talk about all this. And the other great thing he said to me is, if you set out on this journey and God leads you in another direction, don't ever be embarrassed or feel funny to say, okay, I've come this far in this way, but I need to change course. Mm. Uh, frankly, I think telling a teenager something like that when they're setting out on a calling is a, is a powerful gift. Mm. Um, so I've always been grateful for that. Yeah, so I went from East Texas to Southwestern University to Union Seminary in the city of New York. Uh, up to Upper West Side. Uh, Upper West Side, Great. yes. Upper yes. West Side. Upper West Side. Yeah. Great experience. Great experience. Um, loved it. Lo I still love New York City. Um, but when it was time to graduate and then take an appointment, I had visited the Catskills once. Mm. And something about the Catskills really resonated for me. And then I realized that when I was growing up in East Texas, I kept checking out of the library this book called My Side of the Mountain by mm. Gene Craig Craighead George. And it's about a boy who runs away from New York City, lives in a tree in the Catskill Mountains in Delhi, New York, which is now in my district. Wow. So is this, you know, I think we Methodists might call it prevenient grace. Mm. <laughs> God had <laughs> sort of set before me this, uh, unbeknownst to me, a vision about sort of the Catskill Mountains. And so I, I said, you know what, I think I'd like to go to the, the Catskills. And the response of the district committee and the DS was kind of like, why? <laughs> like, you just trained in an urban seminary and, um, really? <laughs> and I said, 
yeah, well, you know what I'm talking about. So mm-hmm. I said, well, yeah. you know what? My first language is rural. So yeah. even if it is uh, Cascamonts, I think I think I can I think mm-hmm. I can make that connection. Um, so I came to the Catskills to take my first appointment in 1989, and I have been here ever since. And I love it. I love it. I mean, along the way, you know, I went back to school and got a couple more degrees um, working in New York City. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I love our churches. I love this district. I love the mountains and the valleys and the farms mm. that, that are part of our district. Um, so that's a little bit about my kind of country background. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. Uh, so what we'll do now is we're going to take a little break and we're going to come back and I'm going to ask you to just share some stories about rural life ministry and where you found hope in those places. So we'll be right back. Oh, 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 oh. Hi there, Jonathan here, and I'm recording this ad to tell you about a resource from the Hinton Rural Life Center. My wife, Shannon, and I have partnered with Hinton to create the Theotokos Connections Confirmation Curriculum for small rural churches. We designed this curriculum with rural youth programs in mind, where you really want to connect their teenagers with the culture, heritage, and place on top of the faith you're trying to instill through the confirmation program. There are six sessions that focus on topics like connecting to self, God, history, church, place, and creation. Each unit has either a Bible story, like the story of Mary or the story of Samuel, or a historical figure like Richard Allen or Harriet Tubman to engage with as part of the experience. But this experience is not just a sit and listen and do a paperwork kind of confirmation. It's an active and connective confirmation program. You might be headed to a museum, helping prepare for a church spaghetti supper, learning new prayer practices, assisting in worship, or volunteering at the local mission agency. It is designed with rural culture and rural life in mind. You can do this in six weeks, six months, and you can do them in most any order or form you want to engage. And I'll tell you, I'm pretty sure it's not just youth programs using this curriculum. I've seen other people get it for their college ministries, as well as perhaps using it as adult confirmation or adult refresher on Methodist and rural culture and life. And you know, if you have other trusted confirmation curriculum you want to pair it with, go ahead. This is a very customizable program. So if you want to bring other lessons from a different program you've used or things you've written yourself, feel free to blend them in. This is also a very affordable program and you pay per student, not for a lump sum curriculum that you may not use all the pieces of, or you may not use but once every two or three years. And this is designed to make it affordable and accessible for you. And it pairs well with Hinton's Theotokos confirmation retreats that happen in the spring. For more information on the curriculum or to place an order, check out hintoncenter.org slash theotokos or hintontheotokos.org for more information. Thanks. So welcome back, everybody. Uh, and so, Karen, I want you to take some time to share with us some of the stories where you found hope, whether in life or ministry or wherever it's found you. Oh, that's great. Well, I've been thinking about it in terms of um, life in ministry mm-hmm. at this moment. I think there's a lot of things to be discouraged about, but what I am finding hope rising in our in our 99 uh rural churches. And we have two communities that are 20,000, 25,000 mm-hmm. persons. So those are the big towns. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have 99 churches scattered over the, the Catskill Mountains, um, Hudson Valley area. And, you know, this is fall. So in United Methodism, it's charge conference season. Yes. And it's my chance to travel and be with our congregations, our pastors and our people. And what I'm finding is after two very long, very challenging years, is emerging hope and emerging vision for ministry. We're kind of stumbling out of a dark, weary place, mm. but um, we're still here. And I sometimes remind our churches, you know, we, we've been here since 1788. Mm. So we've lived through some stuff collectively. And our forebears walked through some hard times, and we can do hard things by the grace of God. So uh, one of the things that has happened in the New York Annual Conference is, as you may know from across Methodism, uh, there's a shortage of pastors. And we've mm-hmm. ran into a shortage. We were 40 pastors short as a wow. covenant. 
So we hit this big pause button on the appointment season, and we went into a time of prayer and discernment. Mm -hmm. um, and we went started with one church and went through all 400 and at that time 422 churches of the annual conference mm -hmm. and all of our pastors. And we created um, a new model of cooperative parish ministry across mm -hmm. the entire annual conference. Wow. Now, we had loose configurations since about 2019 of cooperative parishes, sort of a loose configuration, but this became the intentional structure. Yes. We prayed over every church, every pastor, every leader. Mm -hmm. It was arduous. Um, mm -hmm. And then the, then we started making these appointments. And it is a, a model, a cooperative parish model, you know, has been around for a very long time. And we have a couple of cooperative parishes in our district that have been in place since the 1980s. Mm. But now the difference, there's a couple of differences. One, these are also now suburban and urban and yes. rural. Um, each one's going to be unique. But we looked at the churches, the communities, and the pastors and sought to create teams that we have a lot of confidence in. Now, um, we didn't just put anybody anywhere. And I have said to our pastors you're here because we believe God has called you for this moment mm. and this time and this new chapter. And as my grandma said, if the Lord calls you, the Lord will equip you. Huh. Um, because not everybody can work collaboratively and not everybody's going to make this pivot. There's been a lot of talk about, well, you know, it was born out of scarcity. My comeback on that is always, you know, the feeding of the 5,000 was born out of scarcity. Mm -hmm. There seemed to be a shortage of bread and fish, but in the hands of Christ, no scarcity. We have exactly what we need. Um, but it's a matter of placing it in the hands of Christ and then seeing what God will do. Uh, yeah, it's that, it's that presumed scarcity that, uh, that we're assuming there's scarcity and there's really not. We just have to think differently about what's happening. Right. What if this is exactly what God has planned for this moment? Um, not to mention, so so that that entails a whole bunch of shifts in our thinking, though. Uh, pastors working collaboratively, the the real need for lay leadership and empowerment, um, and it takes us to our circuit writing roots in a different way. That's just exactly what I was thinking. That's really just going back to Methodist and even just Christian roots with Paul and equipping, yeah. equipping lay people to run their own churches and to be part of that and that pastors have to work together with the laity and with the communities. Absolutely. And, you know, actually, it's interesting. I'm, I'm going further back than that in our charge conferences because we're looking at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 mm. to 47. Yes. And uh, talking about what Andrew Roberts called the holy habits mm -hmm. of the early church. It's like whatever else changes, and we've been through a lot of change, whatever else changes, this is our DNA. This is the basic work of the church. Mm -hmm. This is all you have to do. But this is what you have to do. Mm. I don't. I don't care if you necessarily. Oh, did the DA say that? Grow your pews or your numbers. Mm. I love that passage because it talks about what the the early followers of Jesus were doing, and then at the end it says, "And they had the goodwill of all the people, mm. and the Lord added daily to their number those who were being saved." <laughs> so it's not a church growth plan. Yeah. It's a what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus in a vibrant community of disciples? Mm -hmm. And that's not about having the hired professional pastor uh, who, who is the hired Christian. That's about the pastor having a particular role. Mm -hmm. um, but it's about all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, and in that passage is, you know, talk of generosity and gladness. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's been a long couple of years and a long time since we've thought about since we felt some gladness mm. and um, realized that in our giving and our being generous in what feels like a tight and scarce time, we will find our gladness and joy again. I mean, I just think there's so much richness in going back to the roots. Cause, and the pandemic did shake us up and shake us loose. Um, you know, it's been a big challenge. But it mm. shook loose some of our old habits. I mean, I mean, like we would in 2019. I became superintendent in 2019. Interestingly, I used this same passage at that time to get people to tell me about your church. Tell me about your mm. church in light of this passage, right? I went to all of our churches. Uh, then there came the pandemic, and we shut down. But back in 2019, our lay servant committee was saying, 
gosh, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we did like a Zoom class? Everybody know what Zoom is? <laughs> like, it was, this, it was this whole novel concept. Um, well, now we do a lot on Zoom. We are in eight. We are in eight county area. We're mm. hundred churches scattered over an eight county area. Mm. So for meetings and some other things, Zoom has become a great tool. You're not dodging deer at night or dusk. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, it it is a tool mm-hmm. in our little circuit riders bags now. Still, there's nothing like being in person, but mm. uh, we are using some new tools. But what, but the work is the work we see in Acts. Mm. Um, and that's what we've been talking about this fall and sort of living into that in these new cooperative parishes. Each parish is going to be unique because of who it's made up of and the territory it covers. But one of our clergy parish coordinators said to me, you know, it, it feels like this is what we've been waiting for, mm-hmm. but we didn't know it was what we were waiting for. Mm-hmm. There's such a rising energy in the collaborating and each small church not feeling like mm-hmm. in isolation, like we've got to do all this ourselves, mm-hmm. is realizing we got a neighbor five miles away. We literally can be five miles away. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can work together on each fundraiser, each fundraiser's fundraiser. So we can do a shared choir. Mm-hmm. We can do a shared youth group. Mm-hmm. Um, we got a food pantry over here and a thrift shop over there and a community garden over here. But now we got volunteers from all these places. Mm-hmm. Um, so the cooperative parishes for me, Something that was born out of necessity, I think that God is doing something. Mm-hmm. It was a top-down initiative, but it's going to have to, to rise. I think then that's mm-hmm. where our handoff is back to God and say, what will grow mm-hmm. among these persons, nurturing their relationships? Um, the other place that I see hope is actually um, 37% of the appointments in my district are cross-racial or cross-cultural. Wow. Uh, we are, we're a couple of hours from... Uh, Drew Seminary, mm. um, so it's a it's a wonderful opportunity for persons who've finished their MDiv or pursuing advanced study. There's a solid Korean community in the Drew University and the Drew Seminary. And Drew University uh, is located in Madison, New Jersey, so it's 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 it's, 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 yes. near, it's it's close enough for commuting distance if they're doing a degree or an extra degree or something like that. Yeah, it's doable. It's mm-hmm. doable. And uh, though most have graduated and mm-hmm. have come to take an appointment among us or are working on an advanced degree. Um, that group of pastors and these communities, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're navigating uh, new territory mm. by working cross-culturally, congregation and pastor. Mm. Uh, we, there's no assumption that it's all on the pastor to quote-unquote fit in. Mm-hmm. It's really about how do, we, how do we receive one another, grow together, um, receive the gifts of a pastor who's come with a heart full of love to share. And most most of them are younger pastors. Mm-hmm. So they are just, this This is the ground on which I'm working. Unlike mm-hmm. some of our mid-career, later career pastors who are going, why is it not 1985? Um, <laughs> you know, like the stuff that I train for is not working. Um, they just they look out on the, the, the field of mm-hmm. the church and they say, you know, how do we build community, spiritually grounded, um, we're going to stumble over some of our intercultural incompetencies uh, as churches and pa- uh, churches and pastors and DS, but we're also having this tremendous opportunity to grow and learn alongside each other, mm. um, which I think is transformative in its own way. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's just been very a very exciting time. Mm. But it's a heavy lift uh, for the for a pastor, I think, to enter a completely mm-hmm. new world in many ways. I mean, I, you know, I, what I'd said to the, the district committee about, and the DS about my first language is rural. I mean, I wasn't from New York, but, mm-hmm. but I knew that language. Right. Mm-hmm. And I knew I was very comfortable in that discourse, but to come from a, another original language and another, uh, mm-hmm. many of a more urban setting into some of these communities has been both exciting and mm-hmm. scary and courageous and hopeful. Mm-hmm. and a work in progress. Um, this is where we require sanctifying grace and a lot yes. of courage. But but there's also incredible beauty emerging. Mm. That's beautiful. I love it. I think that's so important, and that, that chance to grow together and to be nurtured in a space that is, by necessity, becoming innovative. 
it has to be innovative. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we don't know what. I mean, that's the whole. I like to teach people that the Bible for me is a, a book about making a making a way forward when no way forward seems possible, mm. and uh, living into that. And that. So uh, we also need to define some terms. The cabinet is the group of the district superintendents mm -hmm. who are over over regional areas within an annual conference, which is a larger regional area. They work with the bishop and the bishop staff to sort of administrate as well as uh, be the pastor of pastors in their area to help them figure out what's best for their communities, best for their regions, and how to deal with issues that may arise. And if you've ever been in any church ever, you know issues will arise. So it's <laughs> it's a reality. And then the next thing you said was charge conference. And I think charge conference is yeah. something often misunderstood, even for United Methodists who treat it like paperwork season. When the, yes. the original intent and the current even in our book of discipline, which is our book of polity and theology, is that it is a time each year where every church, charge, parish, whatever you might call it, takes to celebrate the ministries of the previous year, mm -hmm. dream about the upcoming year, and elect people who are in leadership for that, set pastor's compensation, and a few other things. But mainly it's about empowering clergy and lay leadership to move forward. And we often forget that and we tie it up with paperwork. But I've seen a lot of district superintendents lately leaning more into the worship service model than into the mm -hmm. administrative meeting model, which is, I think, is so important because churches need to be reminded we need to celebrate our ministry, our past, mm -hmm. and, and then empower the laity and the clergy for the future. So Absolutely. Yes. I think that was well said, by the way, um, because I think I used to, as a pastor, dread it as paperwork mm -hmm. uh, final exam. Mm -hmm. But what I've come to do is really to lean into worship. And mm -hmm. you're right. When we're talking about leadership, when we are, who are the people who are going to be the, sh the strength of this church next year? The mm -hmm. laity, not the pastors. Mm -hmm. And you know, the stewardship of things generations before have given us, properties, mm -hmm. resources, um, and the stewardship of Aunt Mary. You know, Aunt Mary gives us $10 a month off her fixed income. Mm -hmm. The reason that for me the paperwork and those things do matter mm -hmm. is that Aunt Mary gives us her 10 bucks for the glory of God. Yes. And she deserves that we steward that like a million dollar endowment. And we do. And exactly. we do. And I think that's important. I, I, you listened to the previous episode with uh, Reverend Shay Craig, and she is a st stewardship person, and she talks about that importance of celebrating what people are giving and the sacrifice that they are giving sometimes, mm. making to give to their church and their community and for, to, to God. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, uh, it, it's so mm -hmm. important and to celebrate those gifts uh, of the church. And I think, I think that's such an important part that churches need to take time to celebrate the the spaces they are in. I'm I'm, I'm preaching on Second Thessalonians, the the uh, sort of the beginning salutation of it this coming week, and it talks about and the commentaries are all talking about how Paul is celebrating, always celebrates the churches before he gets mm. into the things they need to work on. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we think about that, the sermons that come up and, and the sermons that celebrate the ministry of the churches, and it falls on Halloween weekend, so I'm passing out candy. We're going to celebrate <laughs> our community and our ministry and, and enjoy that. Yes. That's great. Thank you so much, Karen, for that, for sharing uh, pieces of your story and your ministry with us. Uh, as always, we like to ask our guests if they brought a piece of media, a book, a movie, a TV show, any sort of resource that's giving you hope or you have that might bring others hope. If you would share any of that, what you have with us right now. You know, it's funny. I've been listening to your podcast and I was looking at my own. Um, what are things that give me hope? What are my media resources? And my Spotify favorite list is a mix of like old jazz and country and folk. Yes. Um, so there are a lot of things that, you know, I, I have a playlist for heading out to charge conference um, that, that helps me get kind of oh, energized. I have so many curated playlists. Like I'm going to preach today or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. on a, it's a two hour road trip to get to a workshop I have to give. And it's just to get the energized or to calming down playlist after you're done with something. Oh yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I've always been a big fan of like, you know, Dolly is eternal. Dolly and Reba are just timeless. Oh yes. I mean, let's just own it. Um, George they, Strait, cause I'm a Texan. Oh yes. Go well, ahead. Dolly and Reba just recorded their first duet ever like last year, I think. Uh, yeah. And like, so, so I was just so surprised they'd never worked together before. Oh man. Yeah. And I, I have such a, such a huge fan, but mm -hmm. in, in my first appointment, a little two point charge, mm -hmm. I do, I do play the guitar and I, I will sing. Mm -hmm. Um, so 
there was a little boy in church. He was like five or six years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, his mom was telling me that during the week she had had Reba on mm -hmm. at home playing a Reba CD. And little boy said, Mom, is that Pastor Karen? And she said, no, honey, that's Reba. I was like, oh, I have never <laughs> been so flattered in my that entire life. Wonderful. <laughs> Uh, it's funny. And the more I talk about Reba and Dolly in Texas, then my accent starts coming back in. Oh, it's that's been, important. You know, yes. 30, 30 years in New York, but I can get my accent back pretty quickly. Oh, yes. Um, but, you know, I find a lot of inspiration in music. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Brandy Carlisle and the High Women mm. I've recently kind of discovered. So and beautiful. I, I, ah, it's such a mix. Mm -hmm. um, in Brand, you know, I talked about my grandma mm -hmm. helping me to hear my call, my grandma Ann. Um, but in the, the high women's, the, the song, the high women, um, mm -hmm. Brandy Carlisle has written about, you know, the woman preacher. It says, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's all in mm -hmm. first person. Yes. Great song. Uh, it says, I was a preacher. My heart broke for all the world, mm. but teaching wasn't righteous for a girl. Oh, in the summer I was baptized in the mighty Colorado in the winter. I heard the hounds and I knew I'd been found. And in my Savior's name, I laid my weapons down, but I am oh. still around. It's just beautiful. I mean, one, it's just, just in an economy of words it is such a beautiful snapshot. My heart broke for all the world. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. know a pastor in the world who wouldn't say also that, but yeah. uh, but preach teaching wasn't righteous for a girl. I, I heard that message. Um, mm -hmm. In my Savior's name, I laid my weapons down. Yeah, you know, when people go after me, I'm not always good at wanting to lay my weapons down. Oh, yeah. Uh, but but what is the way of Jesus? I mean, I find inspiration in a lot of different places. I mean, you know, Brandy Carlisle and the the High Women, the Crowded Table. Ah, oh, yeah, beautiful. That's recently discovered that song for me mm -hmm. this fall. That's in my charge conference playlist. Yes. You know, heading out because it's an image of church for me. Mm. Uh, you know, a place, a place for everyone around the mm. table, you know, and a, a place to come home to at the end of our journey. Um, just beautiful imagery. Mm. So I think there's a, I, uh, I, I was just figuring out how to narrow down things that. Um, oh, I'll put it all in the playlist. So don't worry. Oh, oh it's great stuff. Yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was driving along feeling kind of heavy in heart over a death and a funeral. And it was in the the waves of COVID. I was headed out to a church and driving through the district. It's a gorgeous district. And it was an autumn. It was about this time of year. So everything's in full color. And um, I had hit this random Apple, you know, play songs. I didn't, songs I don't know. Just, you know, play me yes. songs. It's just great invitation to the Holy Spirit, right? So um, I'm driving along and I look out to my left and the top of this bare tree is an eagle. And uh, just gorgeous and stunning. And this moment that my heart just lifted um, and that kind of rising on eagle's wings, all the image, scriptural imagery, but just the power and beauty of, and this song came on by Peter Mayer, Mayer called Holy Now. I had never heard it. I highly commend it to you because it's about how he had experienced God in church and through church, but how everything is holy now. Mm -hmm. And how, because we're moving, going out of the church and seeing God, it's very beautiful. It talks about sacrament. It talks, it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's worth hearing and listening to. But it just spoke to my heart in that moment about seeing God everywhere. Yes. Um, everything is holy now. Um, and uh, it, it was, it was just a God thing just popping up on my playlist out of nowhere. Uh, and I think it's about prevenient grace. I mean, mm -hmm. it's also about, you know, I say that the church, we, in the 1800s, in the 1800s, in the 20th century, we built buildings, we went inside of them, mm -hmm. and we waited for people to come, and they did. Mm -hmm. And then they stopped, mm -hmm. and we stayed in the building and waited for them to come. <laughs> yes. Um, and we weren't even sure what we were doing in the building mm. at times. You know, we kind of said, we at times have lost our way. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't sit in the Capernaum synagogue and say, I'm here on Saturday, y'all come. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's, I, I love the church. Mm -hmm. I believe it's a means of grace and the body of Christ in the world, mm -hmm. but it's not the only place God is speaking. Mm. And to, and that part of, we talk about making disciples mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ, but part of being a disciple is learning to see God 
mm-hmm. everywhere. Mm-hmm. And part of the work of those holy habits of the church is training us in hearing and seeing and witnessing God everywhere. Yes. And pointing that that prevenient grace, that love that loved you before you thought about it to everyone. Mm. Um, so all those are kinds of just moments where there are just these, where I find God speaking through my playlist or through the random generated playlist. Oh, yes. Uh, mm. So I commend your attention to all those things. And then, you know, in terms of books, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> I, have a, I have a few books. <laughs> um, Excellent. It'll go on my books, my virtual bookshelf for people. So that'd be great. Well, no, I'm going to, I'm only going to, I mean, in my house, <laughs> I have a few books. I'm going to give you only one to talk about. Oh, okay. But kind of, but a story with that. So when I first went into my first, you know, two point charge, um, mm-hmm. I'd never even had, I never even had a field placement in a church. Oh, wow. I worked, I worked for the National Council of Churches in the, what's called the God Box, 475 Riverside Drive. Uh, that is and true. Then, with, when you're in New York, you have that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very boxy building, and so, yeah. and then I was a uh, an associate chaplain at Barnard in Columbia. Mm. So, when I took my first two point charge, I'd never been in charge of a church or or had uh-huh. a staff role like that. So I got Carl Dudley's "Making the Small Church Effective." Do you remember Carl Dudley's "Making the Small Church Effective"? I've seen the book. It's, I don't know that I've read it's, it. <laughs> it's older than you are. Uh, <laughs> no, it's probably. It's probably, it's almost older than I am. So like it was written in 73. I bought the 12th printing of it, which was in 88. Now, what does that tell you about books about small churches and rural Uh, settings? They're still around for a reason. Yeah. The next one to really come out over the course of my career seems to be um, Alan Stanton's um, Reclaiming Rural, Building Thriving Rural Congregations. Mm -hmm. 2021. It took till 2021. <laughs> um, seriously. And Stanton talks about Carl Dudley and he weighs, he weighs in on, on Carl Dudley. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, but there's a huge gap. There has been a gap in resourcing that valued, examined, mm-hmm. um, celebrated the small church and the rural church. Amen. Um and we have just tried to, and we've all been a, trying to adapt the models of church growth, and church development, and program, so-called. Mm. We've been trying to adapt them and make them fit. And because, honestly, because country people will make things fit. Mm-hmm. I mean, my yeah. my, my great my grandfather could repurpose anything. <laughs> oh, so, exactly. My so, grandfather was the same. Like everything, everything, <laughs> nothing was thrown away because it got repurposed, even if it was yard art. <laughs> exactly. So my, my my granddad did have a lot of yard art too, but the the idea that you can reuse that, you repurpose that, you could do something with that. So we, you know, we'll take it and we'll try to make it work. But to finally hear rural voices rising again, um, in positive ways, your Jonathan, frankly, you're you know seeing your classes on be a disciple, mm-hmm. um, and seeing what you were doing. Yeah have been things that I'm like, oh, it has been a long time. We have needed this. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we've needed the affirmation of this ministry. Yes. Uh, and of these communities. Oh, we are so not real. just, we are not just the agrarian paradise, you know, myth. <laughs> and we are not just rural decay and hopelessness. Yes. And, um, you know, I, I just, unfortunate in telling, but I was talking with a colleague one time years ago. I, as I said, I've, I've been in these rural churches, the small towns, for 30 years in ministry. And a colleague of mine said, gee, you know, you still up there? <laughs> <laughs> it's both literal and figurative, but mm-hmm. you still up there? And uh, I said, yeah, yeah. And he said, um, well, I just don't know who I'd talk to. And I was, I was, I was like, yeah. Thought to myself, I don't know who you'd talk to. Because oh. if you can't hang out at the cafe or the Stewart's, which is a local uh, gas chain that also has a gas station chain that has ice oh, yeah. cream and coffee. Yeah. So if you cannot hang out mm-hmm. with the folks who plow the roads at, at, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning on a break, drinking coffee, mm-hmm. talking about life, life and community and family and mm-hmm. where God might fit and all that and a dozen other things, then yes, you will have no one to talk to. Oh, um I mean, yeah, I've just been at my two churches. You know, I just recently took on two churches after being out of professional ministry for a while. And the restaurants in town, one of them definitely, 
uh, but this might be true for the others. When I go in, they now know my name, my drink order, and if they have sure. news news for me from the community about church members or community members, they will let me know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a mixed bag. It's yeah. a mixed bag. Oh, yeah. <laughs> everybody knows and everybody's talking, and sometimes yeah. it's not quite true. Mm-hmm. Um, my my message this fall uh, in our we have these cooperative parish gatherings, right, mm-hmm. where we're celebrating worship. And then we move into what we call stewardship and leadership, that mm-hmm. annual business meeting. But I've been, my message has been based on those, those uh, on that Acts reading, let's give them something to talk about. And, you know, I've talked <laughs> talked about how we've, we had telegraph, we had telephone, now, and we've always had telemethodist. Yeah. Man, I, I have a conversation in one church, the other end of the county, the next morning I'm hearing about it. Most of it is what I said. Mm. <laughs> Some of it is not. But, you know, I had the you know opportunity to move to one of my appointments. And um, I did tell this story. I was brand new in town, mm-hmm. kind of a mid-year appointment. Mm-hmm. We had an old building, you mm-hmm. know, with some needs. Sound familiar? Um, so well, All of our buildings so are the, less than five years old down here. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, that, that, that could be true, actually. Up here, we've, we've been here. Remember, we've been here since 1788. Our we've got churches that Asbury founded. Well, so, yeah. So all right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So we, we've been around for a while, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the build, so the buildings, we yeah. a lot of us have old buildings with needs. And mm-hmm. I took the trustee chair and myself went to a local foundation mm-hmm. that invested a lot in the main street of the, of the village. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were, we had some particular needs and I sat down, I'm, I'm talking to the executive director in, in mm-hmm. business terms. I said, him, you know, our, our biggest asset as well as our biggest liability mm-hmm. is our buildings. And the man stopped me. Now, he was not a church. He was not a Methodist. He was actually Jewish. And the man stops me and says, I got to stop you there. Your biggest asset is your people. If something good is going on in this town, the Methodists mm-hmm. are in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, I mean, what a, what a cool reputation to have. I felt I'd landed in heaven uh, because the Methodists are in the middle of it. All right. The Methodists are in the middle of it. Man, let's 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 hope they're saying that everywhere. Yeah. About if something good is going on in this town, the Methodists are in the middle of it. Um, Alan Stanton talks about partnering in your community, mm-hmm. and I, I like the way he talks about it because it's not about the church necessarily always deciding the good and being mm-hmm. the good. He talks about also partnering with uh, good things happening in your community mm-hmm. and seeing them as provenient grace. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know what? God's at work in this. How can we partner with it to support mm. it? Um, one of our parish coordinators went to the local school superintendent mm-hmm. and we have about, we have about eight churches in that school district Oh wow! and uh, it's a big geographic area. Mm-hmm. And he said to the superintendent, Hey, your kids are our kids. I got a bunch of, bunch of Methodists. Mm-hmm. Um, we got volunteers and if there's something specific we can help you with, you know, just let us know, mm-hmm. uh, which was, was beautiful and exactly where we need to be mm-hmm. when I think about that early community of disciples and who the church needs to be. That's beautiful. That's, that's so real. Just, ah, oh, the going in and saying, we're here. What do you need? Kind of, ah, oh, so beautiful. Well, and cause so often our churches are feeling like we're tired Mm-hmm. We're maybe aging. We don't have a whole lot of resources necessarily. Mm-hmm. And we forget how much we really do have. Mm-hmm. Um, how much wisdom in the house. How much love. Ah. Multiple, multiple generations. Um, <laughs> we forget mm-hmm. the treasure we have. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm hoping we're recovering that sense of that. And, you know, I... With the partisan mm-hmm. um, tensions in our country, mm-hmm. um, I've I've served churches where we were we were red, blue, green, purple. We were a lot of different colors. Oh yes, and uh, I used to do the every four year speech, you know, about okay on Tuesday, uh, we're we're going to go vote because mm-hmm. yeah, we're going to be caring, responsible citizens, and we are not all going to vote the exact same way. Mm-hmm. But here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to assume ill of one another. We're going to assume we all want the well-being of our community. Mm-hmm. 
And we're going to assume that we might see coming at that from some different ways. Mm. Um, and we're going to, we're going to continue to love each other. Even if we don't always understand each other, we are going to choose to assume that we're all, that we are all trying to envision a loving community where all are cared for, all have what they need to live. And we're just coming at it sometimes from different lenses because what I, didn't want to see was the the breakdown in the church. You uh, know? I need to cut that part out and have a 30 second clip that I just play on loop at places. <laughs> so mm. where are you talking about, <laughs> about what's happening? That's just powerful. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> uh, it's so real. It's so real. Well, Karen, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful time. And uh, you you brought uh, uh, the high women. And then I even, I've decided, I'm, see, you said, let's give them something to talk about. So Bonnie Raitt's going in the pocket. Uh-huh. Let's do All right. And you said, you got me with Alan Stanton and Carl Dudley uh, for that. So it's going to, it's, you've got a good collection of resources to give to people. So it'll, it'll be, it'll be a good time. Uh, and again, thank you so much for being on my podcast. Do you have any, uh, how can people reach you? Do you, are you, uh-huh. I'll have a public facing social media? Sure. I'm on Facebook under my name. Mm-hmm. Um, and Karen Anita, named after my two grandmas. Monk. Ah, <laughs> so I always great. use my middle name or initial. For me, it's a it's a, a statement of strength, their strength mm-hmm. living on in me. Mm-hmm. Um, my parents were wise. And LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, and that's my uh, social media. And if they just are curious about Methodist stuff, they can reach out to you through your email address at the conference. That is correct. Yes. And that is Karen Karen.monk at NYAC dash umc.com we're dot com dot com i'll put that in the show notes as well and we have the magic of google now if they just google you they'll probably find you probably so <laughs> yes usually the the professional stuff ends up close to the top usually so it's that's it's good, good to know <laughs> yeah, usually i haven't googled you i just i you just emailed me so what <laughs> the for the first contact after you signed up for a class all that's right. right i did exactly so all right well we're just going to head and close out the podcast now um Again, thanks so much for being here on Rusty Water Towers. You can listen to Rusty Water Towers wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, we actually even have a YouTube channel. And I want to let you know, because some people prefer to listen to their podcasts on YouTube. So there is a YouTube channel, just Rusty Water Towers. And you can find us on social media, including Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If you have questions, uh, email us at rustywatertowers at gmail.com. Special thanks to my wife, Shannon Lamaster Smith, for our theme music. music named, the song name is Hilda Brand. I record and produce this podcast because my hope is that we can lift up the hope and faith of rural life through this work. Thanks. I live across the railroad tracks in a little lighthouse. Must you pass if you weren't trying to find me? Many of the trees are dead, there's stumps in the ground In a great big yard, across from the fire station Oh, 